Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Asia Rugby Live Real Talk, Real Rugby, where we talk to people from all over the world about rugby all day, every day. And of course, uh, Selamat Hari Raya, Salam Lebaran to all the Indonesians celebrating uh, Idul Fitri. And of course, Eid Mubarak to everyone else in the world celebrating uh, Idul Fitri. Hopefully, this Idul Fitri will bring you all the blessings and uh, prosperity that you all seek for. And uh, another episode, another exciting episode this time around as we have four special guests coming in to join us. But before that, of course, I, I want to acknowledge that Super Rugby uh, is coming on. So I'm really excited for that as, uh, you know, as, as you guys are at home because we've been waiting for that rugby action since uh, no rugby tournament is going on in the world okay don't forget to like and subscribe asia rugby live so where's the subscribe button let me see okay there you go the subscribe button subscribe and push the notification the bell button there you go oh, ah, the notification button so that you can receive the notification from us as uh, in the future okay so the first guest i would like to introduce today none other than michael leach the captain of the japan national team who is also an absolute true legends of the game uh, Mike, how are you doing uh, right now as, uh, you know, there's no training for you guys. So how are you doing? I'm actually doing pretty well. Um, we had a massive year last year, so I'm using this time to um, to relax and uh, do some decent rehab on my body. Oh, cool. That's great, man. At least uh, you are being productive to yourself. Duke, how about you? Okay, now secondly, we have Duke Krishnan. Uh, who, who, his real name is Danish Warren Krishna, the captain of the Malaysian team, currently playing his trade with the Hindu Red Dolphin, the the second Malaysian to play abroad in Japan, which is I'm really proud of you. Welcome. How are you doing, bro? Oh, I'm doing good, bro. I'm doing good. I'm back to my hometown, my parents at the moment. So good to be back with the family and doing some rehab. And in Malaysia, they allow us to do some own training. So I'm doing my own training, doing some rehab. It's doing good, bro. Oh, that's great to hear, man. And I know you've been working out a lot at home as well, using whatever that you can use, <laughs> uh, bands and stuff. Probably you don't have much um, dumbbells, uh, heavy dumbbells, but at least you are working out at home. And the third person I would like to yeah. introduce is Justin Covini from uh, the Philippine Volcanoes. Who currently, Justin is in Nagoya. Welcome, Justin. Uh, oh, Genki Wadoko des. Genki des. Genki des ka? Yeah, here How, how are you doing, man? Uh, you know, you were telling us that uh, there's, you are you guys are not allowed to, to, to train in at the club so you know how are you coping up with things yeah so essentially the last bit of rugby i had would have been in january uh with my team and that was after uh, the gold medal um success with the philippine volcanoes after sea games since then uh, it's pretty much been self-training uh, a lot of the gyms have closed here in japan but luckily uh, my wife and i have actually scoped out a gym which has uh, very good facilities and i've just been uh, living out of there for the last two to three months. Oh, great, man. At least you get to go to a gym. Not like us, we have to work, uh, work out from home. <laughs> okay, and uh, the last person I would like to in introduce is Rishikesh Pansy uh, from Rugby India. The first time I met him was when he was playing for Mitsubishi Dino Boss uh, three years ago. And I'm glad that we get to meet each other online. Rishi, how are you doing, man? In Melbourne, somewhere. Ah, good, Rod. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. And uh, things things are great in Melbourne. My training actually has intensified because I'm married and my wife is training me hard. So, uh, so my rugby is re I've retired from the rugby, but the training hasn't stopped. <laughs> That's great, man. Probably it's because of the uh, two kids that you just had a few a couple of years That's ago. Right. So That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, so uh, of course, today we are going to talk about uh, professional rugby in Asia. And I uh, you know all of you guys, all, all four of you have your own unique story on how you got there. Probably you can start with Mike. Mike, how, uh, you know, the transition, uh, the turning point for you was when you moved over from New Zealand to Japan at, at such, such, such a young age. Was it hard to adapt for you? 
Um, yeah, I guess it was it was hard because uh, coming from New Zealand where we only train twice a day and coming over to Japan and having to train every day on a gravel uh, track was, was pretty hard to adapt to. But um, you know, all the Japanese guys were doing it, so I just... You know, I had just uh, I had to just tag along and do what what everyone else was doing. Um, the rugby was definitely different. Um, I always noticed that uh, in Japan when they play, it's all very structured, and they weren't very good at um, playing in what's front of, uh, what's in front of them. So I felt um, you know my skills that I learned in New Zealand could easily come over here and and use them over here in Japan. Oh, cool. So, which means you got some time to to really adapt to the situation when you are in Japan. So, but in terms of, you know, uh, the language barrier and stuff, did you had a hard time adjusting yourself with that? Um, it wasn't too bad. I had a friend um, from Christchurch that was already there with me and he translated a lot for me. Um, but, you know, the rugby language is universal. So, uh, the the communication on the field wasn't too bad. The only problem I had with communicating was um, with the girls in my class because I was very shy and I couldn't speak. <laughs> I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you know, moving over, uh, Duke, uh, probably you can share with us your experience because uh, you, you know, I've, I've known you since you were since you just started rugby since you just uh, 19 years old when you got the Malaysian under 19 to where you are now the transition we saw you uh, from you were like you know under 19 to where you are now the, so how's the transition like for you from amateur to professional rugby uh it was not easy i say but i enjoyed every bit of it because you know when you're doing what you love to do it was see the struggle that very hard and changing my amateur rugby to professional my it took me the whole season my first season at my first club at Yamaha Jubilo it took me the whole season for me to catch up with the Japanese rugby because they are really fast and they work really hard but it's changed after my second season because the chance the Yamaha rugby give me another chance for, for prove myself that I can do better for the next season and that's where, and they sent me over to South Africa to work hard, uh, to experience and everything. And that's where the transition happened. And I gained more confident when I come back from South Africa and try to play even better. So in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, the transition, uh, how, how do you compare when you were in Malaysia and when you were in Japan? Uh, I would say in, in Japan, they work very hard on details. Everything like us, as they will do, go through everything like gameplay and uh, like the, during the training, the fundamental and then the team rounds. And then we will go for the units. So every details by details in Malaysia, they haven't applied the details yet. So yeah, I would say the details, they're working hard on the details. Right, okay. Yeah, probably, of course, it will take some time for you to adjust. And of course, you are still adjusting to your new club, Hino Red Dolphins, and hopefully you can uh, adjust better in the coming season. Uh, for Justin, um, you know, we, you, you told us some some real good stories uh, before before this when you were transitioning from rugby league to rugby union. Uh, share some some funny stories with us. Of course, you must have some, some uh, you know, bogus stories from that transition of rugby league to rugby union. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the transitions actually, just the two games themselves are very similar in many respects, both being full contact collision sports. But as a rugby league player, you know, whenever we used to tackle someone, the battle was holding the person up and trying to make sure they didn't get to the ground. So a lot of, a lot of my tackle technique was really, really high which in rugby is not very effective considering that the ball is really only in play when it's on the ground. So that was one big transition I had to cope with. The other one was not stepping over my uh, teammates when I was trying to blow over the ruck or seal the ruck. Um, there's no effective or, or active ruck in rugby league. So 
just the whole concept of running over a body. Um, let me tell you, there's a few stud marks left in a lot of my teammates when I was learning uh, the game of rugby union and, and rucking. Hey, can you can you share with us, um, you know, the story of uh, the flying jeepney? How you got your name? <laughs> yeah, uh, well. This was in uh, 2010. I was invited to the uh, Philippine Volcanoes uh, tryouts, trainouts, which were actually held in Sydney, which is where I was uh, born and raised. And I had never played a game of rugby union before. I was a complete leaguey. Um, all I really knew was to hold the ball, run hard, hit hard. So when I turned up on the day, um, you know, the first bizarre thing I noticed was I wasn't the only Asian in the team. Um, playing rugby league and growing up in Australia, I was the token Asian every single time. And it was quite refreshing to go to a trial and, and see everyone that, that was similar to me. Um, thereafter, they gave me the ball and I just ran as hard as I could, um, knocked a few bodies over. And the general manager of the Philippine Volcanoes at the time, Matt Cullen, he, he said, well, you, you're just like a flying jeepney. You know, you, you hit like a flying jeepney. You're going to be the flying jeepney. And um, for anyone who, who doesn't know what a flying jeepney is, in the Philippines, it's a mode of uh, transportation. It's, it's like a mini bus um, where people hop in and hop off at the back. Um, so, yeah, since, since 2010, my uh, nickname has been the flying jeepney and it seems to have stuck. <laughs> yeah. Bro, he was known as the Malaysian Jonah Lomu at one time when he was um, skinny and he was playing at the wing. Okay, moving over, uh, Lucy, <laughs> you have a unique story as well. You were telling me in 2017 about, you know, the, your unique story of you took the leap of going to New Zealand and then after that you took another leap of going to sure. Japan. Can you take us through that story? Uh, sure. Uh, it all started in India for me. So I started playing at the Bombay Gymkhana uh, when I was 18 and... Uh, I enjoyed the game and I took to it fondly and I realized that I wanted to do it to the best of my ability at the highest level possible. So I was on the hunt for any opportunity that was available. We were, so uh, I played for India for a couple of years and we were lucky to host the Commonwealth Games. Uh, at the Commonwealth Games, which was a sevens tournament, uh, one of the Kiwi coaches so us play, said, would you like to come to New Zealand? Jumped at the opportunity, went to New Zealand. Uh, it was all right place, right time for me, to be honest. I was uh, very lucky. And uh, in New Zealand, while playing, for the, uh, while playing for the North Shore Rugby Club in 2011, Kobe at the same time was looking, the Kobe Seiko team in, uh, in Japan was looking for a flanker in my position. So it just sort of fell into place and... That was my first gig in Japan. I went from uh, a season in New Zealand to Kobe for one year. Yeah, that was my that was my start initially. Then after that, you just stayed on in, in Japan for a few seasons and that worked out well for you as well. Uh, and luckily for us, we met a, f a few years uh, ago, 2017, in Tokyo. That's right. So that was, That's that right. was, that That's was right. a great time. Huh? <laughs> No, phenomenal. Japan is such a great place to live and it's uh, it's given me so much. So I'm eternally grateful. Cool, man. Uh, okay, just for our viewers out there, for you guys, uh, please, you can leave your comments below if you have any questions to ask any of these guys. You want to ask Mike, Duke, or you want to ask Justin or Rishi, please leave your questions down in the comment below and we'll... Uh, feature your questions. Of course, we can't feature everyone, but we'll try to pick uh, and choose uh, some of the interesting questions that uh, you uh, want to ask. Okay, moving along, uh, back to Mike. Mike, um, you know, in terms of uh, you, you, you've achieved a lot as a player uh, in Japan and also with the uh, Japan national team uh, at the Rugby World Cup. Uh, and of course, you've been asked about this question why did, didn't you take the penalty kick and why did you go for the tap and go? Uh, but I, I, want, I want to reflect on the leadership at that time. What were you thinking? What were going through your head at that time? Um, so there's a little lot of things going on in my mind at the time. We had um, you know, a couple of minutes left on the clock and 
Um, it wasn't an individual decision, it was more of a collective decision. So when I asked the forwards, you know, how's the scrum? And they said, yeah, we can, we can do it. So, um, you know, the option was to either go for the try or, or take the conversion and go for the draw. So, you know, thinking back, I thought, you know, if we take the conversion and miss, then I'll be, you know, I'll, be, I'll, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. But if we go for the try and, and don't get it and lose, then, you know, maybe that's a better way to go down. Uh, at least we go down fighting. So, um, you know, thankfully we had a plan. Uh, once we scrummed down, we said we're going to take it wide to the edge and then take it right, right back to the other edge and score in the corner. So uh, the plan worked out perfectly. And, you know, that game went down in history. So um, that was a decision that, uh, you know, I look back on and, and uh, you know, it's a, a decision that I was very proud of. How, how did you um, instill the self-belief in your teammates? You know, of course, back in 2015 and the recent Rugby World Cup back in 2019 as you guys were the first Asian team ever to qualify for the Rugby World Cup quarterfinals. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, I was, uh, Japan, Japanese rugby is, is improving, uh, improving massively. Uh, if you look at 2011 to 2019, you know, we're just getting better and better. Um, you know, there's a lot of potential in Asia and um, there's massive potential here in, in Japan. And, you know, to make the, the quarterfinals, it just shows, just goes to show that, you know, um, and if you, know, you work hard, committed and have a good structure in place that, you know, teams from Asia can, can, can make it at the top level. Do you reckon that, um, you know, Japan could, um, after that achievement, Japan inspired the whole world uh, by, by doing that? I think so. Um, if you look at a lot of the, because uh, we're a tier two country, um, if you look at um, a lot of tier two teams, you know, they, we, all have, we all have the same struggles. Um, one thing that gave us an advantage here in Japan is that we could, um, we've got a lot of backing from the club. So, um, you know, there's that financial support that we have that we can we can prepare four years and have time exclusively to, to make the Japanese team better. Um, but, you know, for a team to, to break, like a, a tier, two, tier two team to break the quarterfinals, and it just goes to, it gives a lot of, uh, tier two teams love uh, inspiration. Yeah, cool man. Probably you know, I guess that win of course uh, inspired countries like Malaysia, Philippines, and also uh, India uh, moving forward in terms of Asian standards. And of course, Duke can relate to uh, that as you know. Probably, I think three or four years ago, Duke Malaysia was um, promoted to being uh, the the top division of. Uh, Asia Rugby Championship and you know saying that we haven't competed against Japan yet but do you, do you think that one day we'll be able to compete um, at the same level with countries like Hong Kong, Korea or Japan? Uh, yes, well, for me I believe that we could because I when I started with the national team, Malaysian national team, we was in the division two and we were like uh, really struggling and at that time, I just wish that we make it to Division One or the top top division. So I want to see how that feel. And in few years, we like keep working together and keep working hard to make it there. So if we could make it from Division Two to top, we could make it to even higher if we keep working hard. And it's gonna be the way is gonna be same as hard as Japan did because they came from very long way before they achieved that what they have done now. So it all takes a lot of hard works, and I believe that we could become same as Japan and Hong Kong and Korea. Yeah, cool. I think, uh, you know, the achievement um, that that uh, you guys, both of you have, have achieved so far, I think is quite, uh, it's quite mesmerizing, to be honest. And, you know, uh, Justin also have, uh, have had his fair share of uh, great achievements like you you won the a gold medal for the sea games recently how you know can you take us through that moment of winning the gold medal for the sea games yeah very proud moment obviously um winning the gold medal uh, in the philippines in front of a home crowd in front of my wife and and family um really really proud however the success that we achieved at the Sea Games really begun in 2017 when there was a rebuilding of the team. 
Um, and that started in the Asia uh, Trophy Series in Qatar and were coached by Fran, Fran Obotica. Since that time, we've uh, found a, a whole lot of new players, um, which we've added to the program, guys like Rob Fogarty, uh, Tim Berry, Donald Coleman. Um, they've really added the youth, um, which has been injected in addition to the experience. And when we got to the SEA Games in, in 2019, we actually had Olympic qualifiers under the belt. We had been to the Hong Kong Sevens earlier that year. Um, we also came third on the Seven Series in 2018. So it was just a culmination of a lot of hard work, um, a lot of, you know, communicating, obviously, being a Philippine national player, most of, uh, of the Philippine players don't actually play and live in the Philippines full time. We, we play in our uh, respective countries, uh, which does make it difficult at times, but um, we all had a goal together and that, that goal was really to, to win the SEA Games and, and try to make the Olympics. Um, and we achieve that and, and we move on to our next goals, which will be Asian Games and the following Olympics. Oh, that's great, man. And yeah, you have played in the Rugby World Cup Sevens as well in the past. Uh, you know, it must be a great moment for you and your family as well. Definitely to, to achieve any kind of, uh, you know, playing, playing status within a World Cup is a great achievement um, as a union, uh, particularly the Philippines being so young. Um, at the time, we were coached by Al Caravelli, so we had uh, a fantastic you know, coaching regiment there. Um, that time as well, 2012, was a bit of a golden, golden era for Philippine rugby players. There was about 12 professional players in Japan um, playing at a, a range of clubs um, around the country. And, and using that experience, we were able to crack into that World Cup and you know, just gain experience within the top level rugby, you know, playing against countries like Samoa, Zimbabwe. Uh, we even played Japan in uh, one of our uh, finals games. And yeah, overall, a very proud moment and, and, and good for the union. Oh, that's great, man. And probably, hopefully, uh, Philippine rugby can uh, come back as you guys were doing great, I think, five years ago in the Asia uh, Rugby Championship. Uh, but you know, probably because of the, you know, recent players got retired and stuff like that, that the Philippine national team got um, relegated to the first or, or second division. Uh, you know, moving moving along, I think I want to I wanna talk to Rishi about uh, his experience of, uh, you know, playing in Japan and how you think, you know, playing in Japan can inspire um, players in India, you know, going through, uh, you know, the system and probably playing in Japan one day. Sure. I mean, uh, much like Justin just mentioned, uh, how the Philippines team in 2012 was uh, a mix of professionals and amateurs. That's essentially what's going to take uh, Indian rugby to the next level, in my opinion. People get experience outside, be it Japan, New Zealand, England, or wherever uh, they can get their foot in the door and then come back and contribute to the country and then uh, collectively raise the level. Do you think uh, it would be the same pathway as yours? Um, like, you know, for you, you went to New Zealand first, then you had a, you played in New Zealand for a bit, then after that you went for a trial in Japan. Would you think that would be the same pathway for other players uh, in India? See, Rod, see, Rod there, wasn't, there wasn't a pathway in my time. There was, no one had done it before and and I didn't really know what way to take. So this way worked for me uh but for the for the future players coming through there is a way like i mean if you can prove yourself in new zealand uh japan will take notice or whatever other country you're interested in going to uh it's it's a it's a it's a tested method and it's and it's uh provided results for me so i mean it's for anyone to use now yeah, pro yeah. I I think I would say you you've set another standard for uh, rugby India by doing that, and given the populations that you guys have, I'm sure there will be you know people coming through the ranks and hopefully play uh, professional rugby in Japan. Uh, Mike, you know, we we have spoken about uh, you know these guys, their achievements and stuff. Probably one day you would want to see a H inter Asia Club Championship being played. What do you reckon of that? 
No, I'd love to see it happen. Um, you know, there were talks about a team from uh, from Korea um, joining the top league, but that never eventuated. But I think um, when Japan had the Sunwolves, I think that was a lost opportunity because I thought, you know, having the Sunwolves based in, in, in Japan, you could you could grab a lot of players from Asia um, to give them that experience, so a great Asian rugby, but it didn't eventuate to that. So it was, um, it was disappointing, but... Um, you know, I would have loved to see Duke and you know the boys, um, Justin and uh, Rishi yourself play for the Sunwolves. I mean, that would have been awesome for you know for Indian rugby, Malaysian rugby, and for the Philippines. You know, it would have been just you know the, the experience you would have gained playing Super. You know, that would have been massive for your unions. But um, you know, looking forward, I think you know top league in Japan can afford to have a team from Asia join in. You know. Japan rugby is on the on the on the up now, so uh, you know there's, there's a lot of things to look forward to in Japan. Of course, you can speak about you know the standards of Super Rugby and also Top League. Would you say uh, and 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 uh, you know just a note, you were a Super Rugby champion before. Would you say the standard of Super Rugby is uh, higher or different from Top League? Um, it's a lot. It's a, I would say it's, yeah, it's harder. I mean, the physicality side of it side of it is very hard, but. You know, top league now is so competitive. It's you know you got all the superstars coming over. You got you got good coaches coming over. You know, you got teams with um, great structures. So you know, top league will um, eventually you know compete with Super Rugby one day, but it will take a couple more years until that happens. But you take a, a side like Suntory or or Kobe Steel and throw them in the Super Rugby comp, and I'm sure that they could compete easily. Wow, well, that's. That's a big statement coming from you, and probably okay. Another question, you know, in terms of a uh, player ability and stuff, uh, we all uh, heard recently. Bowden Barrett did his uh, Bronco test for four minutes twelve seconds. D- does any uh, it, uh, Jap- Japanese players have done that before in the past? <laughs> uh, the, bron- the Bronco test in Japan is, uh, you know, s- still new. So, um, no, I've never heard of anyone that can do a Bronco and. And four minutes fourteen. No, no, I've never heard of that before. <laughs> so, w- would you say that, that that's a that's a an extraordinary achievement for him? Yeah, I would say that probably close to the uh, maybe a world record, maybe for guys that run Bronco. So you know, it's got something you got something to to aspire to. There's a lot of fit people here in Japan, as you know, but um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if. That someone can beat that score. Yeah, you know, uh, talking about that, I think a few years ago, Mark Lee, uh, the the first Malaysian player to play in Japan uh, before Duke was there, he was telling me, "Oh man, I hate the preseason in Japan. They, they these guys go hard. These guys train really hard." And I'm sure Duke, can, uh, uh, you know, relating to that, probably Duke, you can tell us a little, uh, share us your experience on that. Yeah, bro. Uh, the preseason is in in Japan. The preseason is really hard because they work all the players to be in same levels and fitness and everything. But I believe during the preseason is where the bonding actually happen because everybody work hard and everybody like keep pushing each other's because during that fitness or during the any any trainings they will be everybody committed to the one goal to get fit and play as one team. So I think, but yes, preseason is like really hard in, in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, um, okay. Let's uh, let's take a question from Facebook. Oh, it's going to be next question. Totally. The queue from the producer says it's going to be next question. Okay, a uh, question for Rish. Rish, um, yeah. you know, relating to the question I asked Duke. So for you coming from you know uh, rugby in India, then after that you went to New Zealand, then after that in Japan, and of course you can sure, sure. See, uh, you can relate the uh, difference of these three countries. So can you comment a little bit on that? On the preseason or just on the difference of uh, training the, and the the style probably of rugby? Pre-season, probably preseason and also the uh, the mindset in terms of training. Yeah, mindset. Mindset was completely, completely different because 
India, everyone's an amateur. Everyone's either studying or working or has a business of their own. So the mindset is fairly amateur, social. Uh, whereas you move to New Zealand, uh, the mindset is similar, but the it's almost like, uh, I don't want to say an amateur mindset, but it's uh, way more professional, way more off the cuff in New Zealand. They don't... Uh, take the detail side of things like the Japanese do too seriously and they just expect players to perform to the highest level when they get to the field. So it's more off the cuff and you sort of create more as you go. While Japan is a different beast altogether. That preseason was uh, was my kryptonite. Uh, much, much, much like Duke, I, I had the mindset of a professional but my body wasn't ready so I, I took... Uh, a season to actually get up to standard at Suntory and then then I was uh, in line to play at that level. But uh, completely different, three areas, three countries, three different mindsets, but that sort of, I had to take a little bit of everything and, and make become a composite player to try and make a success for myself in Japan. Yeah, and you made it for sure, bro. So that's that's great. That is a great achievement for you. Okay, um, we're going to take a question from Facebook. Let us see what's the question. Question to all. What are the possible pathways youth players in Asia could consider to play pro rugby? Probably, uh, Justin, you can answer this. From yeah, Lewis. Well, it's a good question. Um, particularly, you know, being in the Asian region. Um, growing up in Australia, rugby is a part of life, uh, particularly rugby league on the East Coast and, of course, rugby union. So it's very easy to get into, into rugby in those sports in those countries, whereas in Asia, and I can give the example of the Philippines, it's about promoting the game and raising the standard. And it does take time. You know, Philippine rugby at its grassroots level is growing and will continue to grow. Um, and with more time, there's going to be more Filipinos developed in the Philippines playing rugby who will then reach the standard uh, to be good enough to play professionally. At the moment, a lot of the Asian countries aren't equipped to have tournaments and competitions at such a high level. So for some Asian players, that may mean going down the road of similar to Rishi, where you know you go to a country that has an established union with uh, a high level of competition, such as uh, New Zealand, uh, England, Australia, just to name a few. Um, that's probably the number one thing at the moment. Or alternatively, um, good competitions in Malaysia, Sri Lanka, uh, where the standard is, is lifting. Um, getting some exposure there may actually be another pathway for, for those who actually want to remain in Asia uh, rather than, than traveling overseas. Duke, um, can you relate to what Justin just said? Just now? And of course, you, you, know, you started from a humble beginning to where you are now, uh, you know, the transition from amateur rugby to professional rugby. And uh, who, who like really opened your eyes to professional rugby? Uh, I get to, like, first time I was playing in Malaysia, for, I was playing 7s and 15s. And playing professional was his, it was always on my back in my height. I'm like, man, if I could play, you know, it, it's, I'm sure all the you rugby players wish like, to play professional and being an athlete lifestyle. And suddenly, like, at one moment we're playing 7s and I made, like, like you mentioned, that Mark Lee. And we guys were supposed to be roomies. And I saw him and he came and being very professional and introduced, uh, letting me know like how it's the life about the professional lifestyle. And he introduced me to this professional rugby lifestyle. And he introduced me to his agent. And through that, I get the chance to play, to go to Japan and everything. And I still remember um, probably what six or seven years ago when you when you were asking me, uh, you know, to for your videos. So you you started yes. out as a winger. Then after that you were playing uh, second row. You were playing flanker. You were playing all over the place. Then after that you were asking me, <laughs> "Hey, do you have a video of me playing second row?" 
I still remember that question. So, was it hard for you, you know, tra to transition from uh, all this position to the position that you are playing now? Uh, I actually started playing rugby as a second row, and then I was playing sevens. So when I when I changed to fifteen, I was a bit fitter than the actual wingers. The coach asked me if I could play wing. That's the one time and only time that I play winger. But you know, more time I play second row. And yes, yeah, that's the time I ask you for the videos and, and the, but that's the time that. <laughs> That I'm changing up to the professional things that I needed that footage. Oh, cool, man. Okay, next question on Facebook. Okay, let's see the next question on Facebook. Actually, there's plenty of questions coming in. Hi, is there a possibility to the players from other countries to study in Japanese universities uh, scholarship and play rugby in Japanese clubs? Probably, uh, Mike, I think you can relate to this. You... You know, you went to Japan when you were 15 uh, on a scholarship, right? Yeah, I guess it's hard. It's hard right now um, for university students, but um, there's definitely a pathway um, through high school or junior high school. We have a player that plays for Japan. His name is Juong Gu. He's a Korean, and he came over when he was young, and and now he's got a professional contract and he plays for Japan. So. Um, that's one way of getting into Japan early, um, but just on saying that too, I'll, I'd I'd love to provide um, opportunities for you know young kids in Asia to either go to New Zealand or either come to Japan and experience Japanese rugby. Um, do you do you reckon that this um, kind of scholarship is um, would say exclusive uh, to New Zealand only, or is it like open to other countries as well? Um, yeah, any countries from Asia uh, uh, to go to, I'd say New Zealand because, or, or Japan because I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm set up in New Zealand. Like I know how, how things work over there, but um, you know, I would love to set something like that up and send players from Asia over to New Zealand to study, uh, to train, study, or come over to Japan for a stint. Yeah, in terms of. Um these scholarships and whatnot rich uh, is there a similar program probably in uh, india you know where you guys send players over to uh, study and to play rugby unfortunately there isn't uh, but that is that is a great avenue and if uh, if we put uh, wiser minds to the to the task then i'm sure that that's something that can be worked out in the future. That's a great. That's a great initiative. Getting kids in early at fifteen is is brilliant because then uh, the the fear of only playing rugby and not studying is taken care of. You can do both, and uh, that's a, that's an idea that uh, is worth following up on at least for India because it doesn't exist at the moment. Uh, yeah, well, it's interesting when you say that because uh, do you uh, have that problem of uh, when you were playing rugby? Uh, professionally, just before that, your parents uh, asked you the question, hey, you play rugby, you're not studying. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, you can relate to that, right? As an Asian uh, guy. So, yeah, uh, do you have that problem? Ab absolutely. My, my my parents are professionals. My mom's a doctor. So, I was I was headed down those paths. But uh, I, I, I caught the rugby bug early. So, unfortunately, in my situation, I my parents find out, found out that I was playing for India in the newspapers. Because I try to keep it from them and play on the, play on the down low. But uh, by the end of it, they were super supportive. But initially, obviously, like Asian parents, they uh, a professional career is what they're after. I mean, they got that in the end, but in an oblique sort of industry. <laughs> I, I think uh, Duke, you can relate to that as well, uh, right, Duke? Yes. Uh, yes. Even in Malaysia, when I started playing rugby, the rugby is not as as well known as now so to my parents i have to introduce to them that about rugby sports <laughs> and they were wondering like what is this sport and it looks <laughs> like really dangerous and risk and, um, <laughs> and i have to let them know the ball is look that look like the egg shape you know <laughs> so it, it takes a, a big time to for them to understand what is like the rugby 
But after a few years, when they see me, I'm doing well in rugby, they really started to support me. Yeah, oh, that's great, man. Probably, I think it's because of the achievements that you had at a very young age. Justin, um, yeah, you you have Asian parents, so uh, can you can you relate to that, or were you, you were your parents hundred percent supportive of what you were doing? Yeah, I wasn't allowed to play any kind of contact sport until I made the decision on my own when I was fourteen. Um, oh. So. I was stuck playing basketball, soccer. Um, I got approached when I was actually uh, 11 years old to play for the local rugby league club, um, but that was shut down very quickly. Um, but being 14 and rebellious, I decided to play rugby league for the school, which I did. And by the age of 17, I was in the semi-professional teams, um, which had a pathway to the NRL. And at that stage, um, every game, my my mum, who's Filipino, she went to, she'd watch all the games like this. Because she didn't want to see me get tackled. Um, from there, um, in terms of you know strictness and, and my parents wanting the best for me, um, I finished. Uh, I graduated from university in two thousand and seven with a bachelor of laws and a bachelor of arts. And my father actually had a very stern word to me and told me, "You need to give up this rugby idea. It's going to go nowhere. You need to just focus on being a lawyer." And um, With me, anyone who knows me, you tell me I can't do something. I'll I'll prove to you that I can. So, from 2008 to to 2012, I was a uh, fully practicing lawyer in Sydney, whilst also playing um, reserve grade rugby league, which is the the level below um, the NRL. So I was playing for the West Tigers reserve grade and also the Sydney Roosters. Um, and the opportunity to come to Japan actually came in in late 2011, and and by 2012 I was in Japan. Oh, cool! So, oh, you have an in- all of you three have in- an an interesting story. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna ask this to Mike. Mike, <laughs> you know, yes, you you moved when you were 15. Did your parents have anything to say about that? <laughs> um, well, my mum was uh, she didn't want me to go. She she said I, I she said I had to finish school before I went over. But my dad was he already bought the ticket. And he said, "Go, because uh, you won't, you won't get an opportunity like this again." So. You know, so right. and my mother thought I'd be back home in in two weeks' time, but you know, I came over here and it's been, geez, it's been sixteen, seventeen years now. Oh, cool! <laughs> oh, unique story. I, I, you know what? I didn't expect this from all of you guys. It's actually a great story from each and every one of you. Uh, okay, you know what? We're gonna take a, a Facebook question, another Facebook question, one more. Okay, what's the question? Oh, to Leech, uh, Mike from Mafizol. What, what considered the boldest step of Japan rugby rapid growth in quality? Uh, I'd say the coaches, um, the coaches and and international players that have come through Japan because they've really changed Japanese way of thinking. You know, we've had top coaches like you know, Eddie Jones come through, Jamie Joseph. Um, who else was Robbie there? Dees. Robbie Dean, uh, Wayne Smith. You know, there's all international coaches coming through, and they're teaching all the Japanese uh, players. So, you know, that's been a, a massive a boost to Japanese rugby. Or oh, do you reckon? Um, yeah, of course. You, you did mention about the other players, the um, you know world class players. We have Dan Carter playing in in Japan. We have uh, Kieran Reid also playing in Japan currently. Um, Do you, how does this high-profile players lift the uh, quality of rugby up in Japan? Well, they just influence um, the younger Japanese players. So they see guys like Matt Gatto, just the way he trains, the way he applies himself to the game. You know, most players don't know how to pl- apply themselves. So when they see a you know a top international player prepare for for a game, you know they can see that. And, Mimic their actions, and you know it becomes a habit, and everyone starts doing it. And then all of a sudden, you know you got a, a well-functioning team. So you know those, those team, those guys that come over, they have a you know they have a massive impact on the young Japanese players come through, and myself included. Uh, Rich, were you? Um, did you feel intimidated? You know, when you went to Japan and you play against all these world-class players, were you at first? Were you intimidated? Uh, I think fortunately I wasn't because uh, 
we've got lots of uh, the Bombay Gymkhana where I started playing my rugby and learned my rugby. Uh, we've got lots of prima donnas. We've got lots of uh, superstars who aren't really superstars. <laughs> so I wasn't. I was. I was exposed to the. I was exposed to that early. So I really. They became friends. Most of the players became friends. So I wasn't in awe of anyone, fortunately. Oh, okay. That's cool. What was was Philly Philly uh, a, a prima donna? <laughs> Philly, if you listen. <laughs> Uh, Philly wasn't a prima donna. Nah, he was a <laughs> he was a spirit shooter. He was a good uh, good professional uh, rugby player with a with a good positive outlook. Yeah. Oh, cool man. Uh, okay, you know, I just want to relate these questions to to everyone. Like, pr- probably Duke, you can you can uh, you know comment on this as well. Like when you first went, go to Japan, have you ever felt intimidated playing the likes of Michael Leach? You know, on your opposite. Uh, or you know, might get to a recent Take everyone to talk because I'm not at a budget. Yes, I, I, I'm always like, like in in Yamaha when we're preparing for the for the game, we watch the key players, and I used to watch Michael like every time he, because you know, every time he get the ball, it's gonna be happening something. So. We guys always <laughs> like I always intimidated like man I need to stop this guy before he do did something you know some magic around and his steps is very dangerous most of the time so yeah. Uh, you know you you played with uh are you Mugoru Moru last uh, last time? Uh, you know how was he as a player? Uh, when I first joined the club, I thought he will be very because he was that superstar in in Japan during that time and. I was thought he will be like very arrogant, but once you get to know him, he's like very friendly in in, in the team or outside in the field. Also, he's like really friendly with everyone, and it's funny to 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 you know to be a good friend. Oh, cool, uh, Justin. You know, uh, of course, you you transition from rugby league to rugby union. Uh, do you know any of these guys when you went to Japan for the first time? <laughs> I was actually just going to say that it's like, in terms of being intimidated, it's hard to be intimidated when you really don't know who the players around you are. Um, but I did my research and, you know, guys like Ricky Flutti, Vine Olivier, you got the Honey Badger, Elio Tisipola. These guys have had so much experience on the international circuit. I was quick to research them. And rather than be uh, like intimidated by their experience, I was just hungry to learn. So... I would ask them after training, during training, you know, can you show me this? Can you help me with this? Um, and because of those guys, it really helped me to transition from rugby league to rugby union a lot quicker than what it say normally would. Oh, cool. I guess uh, that helps a little bit. So guys, probably you can start with rugby league first, then go to rugby union. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah. That, that that could be a pathway. That could be a pathway. Okay, so we have another question from Facebook. Um, let let us see. Let us see. Okay, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. You know what? The the question is not coming. We're gonna ask the question after this. Okay. Uh, talking about perseverance in um, playing in top league. So of course you guys has have had your ups and downs and stuff. So, Rich, can you you know tell us a story about perseverance uh, playing professional rugby? Uh, where do I start? Uh, there are so many there are so many instances where, firstly, rugby is such a phenomenal teacher. It uh, it gives you the highs and it gives you the lows, but it's uh, such a rewarding uh, such a rewarding sport. I've played a lot of sport in my time, but nothing like rugby. Uh, to give you an instance of perseverance, I was uh, I was first contracted to Kobe. I I was over the moon. I thought I'd completely made it, uh, but surely that was surely enough. That was uh, premature. Got injured, got cut, uh, and the next day I was out of work. And I thought that was the end of the dream. But again, thanks to rugby, it's such a such a good community the world over. I went back to my rugby community in India, sort of uh, uh, let let wounds heal, 
And then I gave it another try. And uh, the second time I tried, I got rejected by the first team in Osaka. Uh, and then Santori had, uh, Santori was looking for someone. So I put in, an, I got my agents to sort of chase that up. And they said, sure, if you're interested, come and try out, but no promises, obviously. And by that time, I was, uh, I was verging on desperation and I was uh, uh, a, big, uh, a big believer in myself. So I went there, had a crack, fortunately did all right. And then I, I got the work at the end of it. So, I mean, uh, it's perseverance, no doubt, but it's because of the rugby that I've played for the last how many of years that allowed me to persevere in a state like that. Uh, it's just, it's a great teacher and it's a great, it's a great lesson. Uh, oh, cool, man. You're talking about perseverance and of course, all of you guys, um, you know, four of you have uh, high determination, I guess, to be where you are right now. Uh, Justin, we have a question from Facebook. It's not going to appear there. I'm just going to read it here. Uh, you know, Justin, were the Philippine Volcanoes a professional side and also a national team? So the Philippine Volcanoes has never been a, a professional side, um, unlike the Tier 1 countries. We, we really do this for the love of the country. Um, at the Philippines is, is, an, is an amateur team at present. We pay for our own flights to attend training camp and it doesn't matter where you live there. A lot of the boys live in England, uh, Australia, some live in the States. We all pay our own way to play in the Philippines. Um, when we are in the Philippines, where we um, have our setup at training camp, we are provided food and, and beds. And um, luckily we have great world-class coaching. Um, but in terms of getting a pay packet, um, that, that just doesn't exist. Um, you know, if, if you think back to the Asian Five Nations in 2013, 2014, that was a six week camp. And during that entire time, uh, a lot of the boys had to take time off work, um, spend their time away from their respective families and they weren't getting paid. So, um, no, it isn't a professional side, but, but we really do it for the love of it. And hopefully one day the Philippines can have a professional setup. Um, to the point where you know players can can be paid and live and train in the Philippines. Oh, a great story of for the love of it. I think Duke can relate to that as well. For the love of it, as uh, Duke has played for the national team without being paid at all, huh, Duke? Uh, uh, yeah, bro. Like in Malaysia, the the rugby is like slowly but growing fast, like growing at the moment. So. Since the time we started, and now is, if I compare from since the start that I play, now is we getting much better support. So I'm looking at the positive side that we are getting more support than before, and I believe like in future we will get better in player welfare and everything. Yeah, for sure, for sure. One day, hopefully. Okay, I think uh, the next one, we're going to talk about the Mongolian scholarship that uh, Mike, you, you've started this scholarship. Uh, you know, can you, can you tell us a little bit about this uh, Mongolian scholarship? Yep, so um, I started this uh, Mongolian scholarship just based on the fact that there's a lot of Mongolians here in Japan that are in the sumo setup and they've done really well for themselves. And, um, you know, Mongolian, Mongolian rugby is still very, very raw. So um, I thought that if I got a young Mongolian boy over here and started him, uh, started him up in rugby, um, it, could, it could start a pipeline for young Mongolians to play rugby in Japan. Um, yeah, what was the reason that you picked Mongolia is because there's a lot of Mongolians in Japan? Yeah, a lot of Mongolian sumo wrestlers. Oh, sumo wrestlers. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, you reckon that there's a lot of potential of these guys, you know, rather than being wrestlers, being re good at wrestling, uh, you know, yeah. they would be good at rugby players. Yeah, and they're tough too and they're hungry. So, um, I'd like to get someone that's, you know, hungry and wants to, you know, wants to make it to the top. So, you know, Mongolian, um, the character of the Mongolians are very tough. So, I think they would suit the Japanese lifestyle because you know it's you got to be tough to to stay over here. 
um, you know, training every day, you know, language that you don't understand. So you've got to have someone that can tough it out for a good you know, couple of years. Now, before I proceed to the next question, I would like to know, what, what, is this more of a uh, individual um, initiative or is it like uh, you are, um, you know, working with others to, to bring this, these people to, to Japan? Uh, that's, a, that's an individual initiative, I guess. Um, but I am working with um, a few guys from the Mongolian Rugby Union and they're doing a fantastic job of finding uh, the right player. So, unfortunately, with the COVID nineteen virus, um, has you know, it's, it's a bit delayed. But he should be coming over in the next couple of weeks, I hope. Oh, cool! Individual wow. um, initiative. I think that, that that's a great initiative, and probably, hopefully, a lot of people would follow your footsteps uh, in the future, bringing people from probably their own respective countries to you know Japan and give them a scholarship but the, the thing is there's a lot of work to be done a lot of groundwork I'm sure you know about it and it's, it's a really hard job I guess to bring a person from one country to another to relocate them to give them you know um, money to give them for, for them to money to spend money to live on and also education uh, just not rugby I'm sure you know um, I think do we have wait uh, producers, do we have a question from Facebook? Oh, we don't have a question on Facebook. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Duke, life after rugby. What, what's in store for you? What, what do you have a plan for? Um, at the moment, I, I believe that I can bring back whatever I learned from Japan as a professional rugby player. I can bring back to Malaysia and start some coaching or like. So, help someone to like just teach them what is what it is take the professional lifetime so i hope uh, i can come back and share my knowledge with the young kids or the upcoming players in the future once i'm done playing professional rugby oh cool how about how about you justin um what's your plans for life after rugby uh, well, uh, in the immediate future, uh, my wife and I plan to start a family this year. So that's going to be a, a nice thing to juggle. I have a few little flying jeepneys uh, around the house. Um, <laughs> tra train them up um, to play rugby. Uh, in terms of life after rugby, I'd really like to contribute back to, to the sport, whether it's um, you know on the training paddock or as a coach. Um, it's given me so much. Um, you know, maybe I can contrib contribute at a corporate level, um, you know, coming from an educated background and having my law degree, um, whether that would be through Asia Rugby or World Rugby. Um, any opportunities there, I I'd definitely look at and um, try and help grow the game within the region um, just to promote it to all the, the young Asian players out there who are, who are looking for a chance and, and to get a similar opportunity to what I have been given. Do you reckon you'll be doing it uh, just in the Philippines itself or are we talking about generally Asia? Uh, the Philippines and Asia, both, I, I, can, I can address both, even if it's with, um, you know, like, a, like, a, like with Asia Rugby or, or any kind of, um, you know, uh, a company that funds, you know, rugby within Asia, I, I'm happy to contribute positively. Um, for the region, for the Philippines directly, and, and generally for world rugby, for the love of the sport, generally. Oh, cool, man. That's great. Uh, Rish, uh, of course, you are in the life after rugby now. So, um, <laughs> fresh, any word, fresh in any the words life of advice? Rugby. All right. <laughs> any words of advice uh, you can you can give uh, us to aspire, you know, young kids uh, watching us right now? Uh, for young kids, I'd say do everything. Study, play rugby. As young kids, you don't need much downtime. You can do everything and you should do everything because maybe that way you'll take all the opportunity that's available to you. Uh, but, I mean, speaking of life after rugby, I mean, it's uh, inspirational to listen to what Mike is talking about with regards to Mongolia because that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's a great example to sort of... Uh, a person like me, I mean, having India, having the, having a connection with New Zealand, having a connection with Japan and trying to, and now obviously Australia as well, uh, a four continent connection is, is 
I mean, I'd I'd be uh, remiss to say that if I if I can't work something out, then I'm not using myself to my best capacity. So I'm eager to try and figure out how I can help Indian rugby to these three, four channels that are available to us now. Uh, but inspiration-wise, uh, rugby. Once you've caught the bug, I mean, you don't need uh, you don't need much to keep you going to rugby training or rugby games. Uh, so, I mean, once you once you're in there, enjoy it, play for the love of the sport. When things happen, they'll happen. But until then, just think like a professional, train like a professional, even if you're an amateur. Oh, nice. Good one, good one. Uh, Mike, uh, I want to go back to the question of uh, life after rugby for you. What do you have in plan uh, for you for life after rugby? Um, I want to I want to grow the game in Asia. I think Asia has massive potential. And you know, back when I first started playing for Japan, two thousand and eight, you know, we travelled to countries like Kazakhstan and Sri Lanka, you know, Korea, Thailand. Um, so we we travel all to, all all to the all to the Asian countries. So I want to um, you know, give back to to those Asian countries, whether you know get a coaching team together and and do clinics across Asia. I'm not too sure, but um, that's where my heart is at the moment, and I want to want to follow that path. Uh, you know what? Probably I might just uh, give you a call after this and ask you to come to Malaysia and do a clinic <laughs> as soon as yeah, as soon as. as <laughs> We are, uh, our lockdown is dead. Uh, he's got a right? couple more years of rugby. He's got a couple more years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After you, then. After you, then. Uh, yeah, so after this, yeah, send me a text, your number. I think I'll go to the Philippines first. Because I play on uh, that, and, uh, uh, that ground before the ends. Right. Okay, any uh, words of advice uh, for you, for, for, for our young kids, uh, aspiring kids? So you're asking me? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and it'll be the same as Rishi has, you know, just try everything, um, you know, do your study, play a lot of sports, um, just fall in love with something and, and just follow it. You know, it doesn't have to be rugby, but, you know, rugby is a great educator, you know, great opportunities in rugby to, um, you know, find something, love it and, and chase it. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. You know what? Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much, Michael Leach, uh, Duke Krishnan, Justin Covini and uh, Rishi Pansi for you guys to be here, to be with us, to be with me on uh, Monday evening. For us in Malaysia, it is a holiday because it's Ideal Free 3, but I'm sure for you guys it's a working day. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, again, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, for you guys, don't forget to be with us same time, uh, same day next week on Asia Rugby Live as we, had, as we bring you a new episode. Uh, you know, Again, if you have any comments, if you have any suggestions, please leave it down below uh, as you will take every comments and every um, questions seriously. All right. See you again next week. Don't forget to subscribe. Do not forget to press the notification button. I'm Rod. See you again. And this is Asia Rugby Live.